Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation about how CA broke the rules in building a new documentation system. Your main presenter today is Jim Turcott. He is SVP, a business unit executive with CA Technologies. Also, up briefly later on, will be Larry Furr with Lingotech, who's the head of product management, uh, Tobias Einstadt, CTO of K15T Software, and last is myself, PG Bartlett. I'm responsible for product marketing here at Acrolinks. I want to give you a bit of background before we get started, um, but Jim, go ahead and advance to the next slide. I spoke with Jim and a couple of colleagues about six weeks ago about what they're doing with their doc ops approach to doing technical content. And I've been in this business now developing software to help the technical documentation process for 20 years now. I have never seen such a creative, inventive approach to creating technical content. I've never seen this before. I thought, and I was stunned by what I saw. I was blown away. And I'm, and and a lot of what I believed about technical content and how it was done uh, has been turned on its head. There are some very interesting ideas in what you're going to hear today. You may not agree with all of them, and it'll be interesting to discuss them during the Q and A session at the end. Uh, but having joined, uh, I joined Arbitex, in fact, 20 years ago. And so I've been in the SGML and then, of course, the XML world for uh, a long time now. And I've, I've always believed that XML was the way to go. But here we have a, pre a, a different approach to doing technical content that seems to achieve many of the same goals, but achieve a lot more goals besides. So with that, I hope, is a good way to tee up this presentation I'd like to introduce you to Jim Turcott. Take it away, Jim. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for, uh, for hosting this. Welcome, uh, everybody. It's always fun to uh, you know, get some feedback from uh, your fellow professionals. So I thought before we get into you know, how we did Doc Ops, really I thought I'd spend a few minutes on why we did Doc Ops. And if you look at this chart and you think about really what's happening to our industry, and I don't care whether you're in banking, retail, uh, you know, the technical industry, right, things are moving at an extremely rapid pace. You know, we're, next month we're going to celebrate the eight-year anniversary of the iPhone, right, and that was really the beginning of some of this momentum. But what's happened recently is with the proliferation of mobile and cloud computing especially, and Internet of Things really coming up fast and furious, uh, the belief is that over the next five years, we are going to see an amazing rate of change in the technology industry, right? And that'll propagate across whatever business you're in. You know, the CEO of, um, of Chase will tell you he's really not a bank. He's a software company in the banking industry. And if you think about what you're able to do today, in the banking industry, you can deposit a check with your iPhone sitting at home. You're probably not going to Blockbuster anymore. You're streaming video on Netflix on your smart TV, right? Another connected device. And, you know, the list goes on and on, right? Home security, wireless, Bluetooth, sound, in cars and at home. So what's happening now is the businesses out there really require extreme agility and they need to operate differently than they did in the past. You know, a company like Blockbuster probably didn't have the agility they need and Netflix came along in a heartbeat and wiped them out. And we're going to see more and more of that as we move forward in, in this environment. So really what's happening is business is being written by software. Software is changing the way business needs to operate. So what is software development doing? Right? They're evolving because they need to move at the, at the same rapid pace. So you think about 20, 30 years ago, we probably, those of you that were in the business, were trained to do waterfall development. Waterfall development releases were, you know, once a year maybe, uh, maybe every six months if you were really quick, and you did slow stage testing, right? You would do unit testing, functional testing, so on. And what, if you look at most tech companies today, they've moved to an agile development methodology. And they're in this kind of this scrum approach 
where they're able to spit out code in weeks and days. And in fact, there are companies out there today that can literally turn code in hours. And that includes deep integration testing. Now the reason that software development is able to move in that direction is through a lot of you know, automated testing, regression suites. It's through high degrees of collaboration, which is what we're going to see with DevOps. If your company isn't developing software in DevOps today, they certainly will be in the near future. And DevOps, which is really agile on steroids, says, hey, development and operations really need to be one. They really need to have a high degree of collaboration. They need to have strong analytics as to what's going on in the operational side so that development can react. Development needs to be extremely agile to react to the, the analytics coming back from their customers or operations. Right? And you need to do continual integration testing. So there's some key attributes when you think about how DevOps is really going to roll out and where the industry is going. Now the problem is, quite frankly, is the technical content supply chain is just not keeping pace. So you've got, you know, this technology, you've got mobile, cloud, and Internet of, Internet of Things really moving at a rapid pace, and coding and testing or software development is moving at the same pace. Right? It's working hard to keep up with new processes and new tools. But for some reason, people have ignored the content supply chain. It's just become kind of the ugly stepchild. And my guess is that if you're, if you're a tech writing, you're in a tech writing business, which is really about delivering information, you know, when I go out and I visit other tech companies or any other businesses, what I find is the same thing in every company. I find a team of tech writers attached typically to a development or R&D group. I find kind of a heavy-duty documentation management system. You may call it a CMS documentation management system, whatever you call it. And those tech writers are really trained in how to use that system. And they essentially do all the writing up until the product goes GA or goes live. And you could output in PDF, you may output in HTML, but in whatever form or however you do it, you're essentially publishing content out on the website somewhere. And I tell you, if you go to any website, you go to Apple, right, you go to Verizon, it doesn't matter, you will find the original documentation manuals that were published by the tech writing organization in that company. But what you'll also find are hundreds of other articles that were published post-GA. Because typically, almost any technical support organization, as an example, will discover that there's additional documentation to be written. It may be further clarification on a problem, maybe a troubleshooting guide, or it may be a, just an absolute problem with the original documentation. But to me, they're all documentation bugs from the first publication at GA. But the industry has always separated the two. We've always separated development from operations. So tech writers work hard through development. It's their job to go figure out everything that needs to be written. And they're the ones that do essentially the bulk of the writing until the product goes live. Now, from a customer point of view, what we've done is we said, hey, here's like all these original documents, here's the support articles. By the way, there's probably some things, something from education, maybe something from your services organization, depending on the industry you're in. And we sort of tell the customer, have at it, here's a search engine, see if you can find the answer. And these sites get extremely confusing, complicated, and somewhat frustrating. So that's kind of where we are, and that's where we were at CA. That was the problem that we were encountering. And again, no matter who I talked to in the industry, everybody was basically in the same mode with the same challenges. 
So we said, what is it we really want? What are the attributes that we really need? And if you stop and think about the attributes of DevOps and where that you know, methodology is going, it's very similar to what we wanted for content. And that's really where the term doc ops, you know, came from. So some of us joke, we call doc ops the cool cousin of DevOps. And our take is, as the industry moves to DevOps, and it will, and if you talk to Gartner or Forrester, you know, anybody doing software is going to move to DevOps over the next, you know, two, three, four, five years. And our argument is you need doc ops to go with it because the ecosystem around DevOps needs to be complete. So the key attributes we were really looking for, number one, it needed to be agile. We needed to be able to know when there was a problem and be able to publish extremely quickly. And as I go through this presentation, I'll give you some real life examples as to not only how we solved this problem, but how we actually used it to enhance our customers' experience. Number two was continuous updates. We no longer wanted to just stop at GA. We wanted content to continually be a living, breathing uh, you know, piece of information for our customers. We didn't want to come to them in a kind of a buckshot approach. You know, here's the content, here's the core content, here's the topic we've published, and we mature that topic throughout the life cycle of the product. So technical writers, or at CA what we call information engineers, really own that information delivery from womb to tomb, from the beginning or concept of the project until end of life of that product. Now the workload obviously goes down over time. We wanted collaborative authoring. We said there's a lot of smart brains out there across not just the enterprise, pre-sale, services, support, but we also wanted to take advantage of customers and partners where it made sense. So we wanted to get more into a quote-unquote crowdsourcing approach to authoring. So that was key. Customer interaction, I felt that the tech writers were sort of in the back room and really didn't have a good feel as to how or if their content was really solving customer problems. So we lacked a closed loop or what I call voice of the customer. So being able to interact with customers and understand the analytics of what was working and what was not working was instrumental in the go forward plan. And last but not least was content aggregation. We knew there was other things that we wanted to bring in or mash up with the content. And that was critical as well. And we'll share that with you in a minute. So with those attributes really in our and kind of in our gun sites, we looked around and what we came up with is what we call the Doc Ops platform. Now, this is kind of a simplified version, and we're going to go get into this in more detail in a minute. But the core of the platform, if you go to the collaborative authoring and content aggregator right section of this chart, the core there was we chose to put in a wiki. We chose Confluence from Atlassian. Confluence is a wiki enterprise, you know, robust enterprise wiki product. And what we've done is we've thrown out our document management system and we put in the wiki because collaboration was our number one goal, right? And the wiki from Confluence allows you to do that. Now, um, I refer to it as a wiki plus plus or a wiki on steroids because one of the things that we liked about Confluence specifically by the way, the product isn't important. It's really more around the concept of collaborative authoring. So Confluence allows you to choose over, from over 400 third-party plugins. Right? And that's how we came to end up doing business with K15T and Acrolynx and Lingotech. So these are, these are you know, vendors that work very closely with the Confluence product. So number one, um, 
wiki allowed collaborative authoring. Number two, it had the ability to add tech doc capabilities through these plugins. And number three, it's extremely easy to use and teach other people. We can go to a developer or a product manager or a support engineer and literally train them how to either edit, write, do QA, or start to write their own documentation, right, which is kind of cool. Very simple to use. Kind of a WYSIWYG, you know, to use an old term, approach to content. Now, once we had the wiki as the core, we did need some basic tech doc capabilities. And that's really where K15T and Acrolinks come in. K15T has a couple of plugins in the platform. And the two that I'll talk about today is, one is helping to integrate the Acrolinks product. Right? And Acrolinks, as you know, really maintains a standard CA style and quality of English, or what we call kind of an automated editor. And the Acrolinks portion of this is important because, number one, uh, a lot of the writers, for instance, sit in India, and English isn't their second language. So we wanted a document that was grammatically correct and clearly was as clean from a style and grammar standpoint as it could be. But even more importantly, the better the editing, the faster and cheaper we could do translation. Right? Garbage in, garbage out. Right? And that was the problem with translation. So we needed quality. And in a collaborative authoring environment with people from around the world, Acrolinks played a key role here to ensure we had the highest quality standards. And PG will take you through more of the Acrolinks product in a minute. Now, the other thing that K15 does for us, K15T, is uh, one of their products is scroll versions. So that allows us to maintain version control. Uh, every product has a wiki. And when you go into that wiki, you've got multiple versions of the products. You got the current GA that's coming up, you got the current production release, maybe production plus one or plus two. So it's not uncommon for us to have, you know, three, four, or five versions out there. And K15T does a great job, their scroll versions, of helping us maintain that, that version control. So again, we, we installed the wiki. We added some basic documentation management uh, properties with the help of, of those two vendors. And now what we needed to do was to move to translation. We wanted translation to be done um, out in the cloud. Now this entire platform, by the way, is in the cloud. There is nothing on premise at CA. Totally cloud-based product which again is, is one of the key drivers that kind of started us on this path to begin with. Even single sign-on uh, with CA, which is a CA product that we use, is sitting out at an Amazon Web Services. It's an entire cloud solution. CA so, yeah, used to do translation in-house. We had our own machine translation engines. And when we moved to this Doc Ops platform, we really wanted to be able to plug and play to different vendors very quickly. So let me just drill down a little bit on how the translation works. And in a minute, Larry from Lingletech will kind of deep dive uh, a little more on this. So if you're in the wiki as an information engineer, you may be completing a, um, a sprint if you're in the agile methodology, uh, or you may just be ready to wrap up a release. Right, whatever product you're documenting is ready to go live in the near future. And what the engineer can do is literally hit the translation button. It's like hitting the easy button from Staples, Office Products. So they literally just hit the button. And what will happen is Lingotech gets a note, right, gets a, a message, and essentially reaches back and takes the content of the wiki. Now, process and the tool and the integration is smart enough to know you can decide whether you want to translate the entire wiki contents for that product or only translate what's changed 
or been edited since the last translation cycle. So it's up to the information engineer to figure out which is the better opportunity or the better path. Now, Lingotech really acts like a traffic cop, and what it does is it knows that product A came into Lingotech, and it knows exactly what languages we want to translate that product into. So let's assume that we're going to do three or four languages. We've set up already in the Lingotech dashboard workflows by product, by language. And what Lingotech will basically do is say, for product A, for Spanish, send it to vendor A and C. Right? For Korean, it may go to vendor B and D. Now, those vendors have been pre-selected by us, CA, based on a combination of cost and quality. Some vendors do better with double byte versus single byte, right, and so on. So um, now at the end, what you'll end up with is multiple versions of the wiki in English, Spanish, and Korean, and, you know, whatever languages were pre-selected. By the way, those are pre-selected, you know, back at the start of the project, working with product managers, right? We've already decided you know, what are the appropriate languages based on that software product. So today the translation is manually executed. In the future, we will change that so that once a wiki has X amount of, um, you know, execution activity or editing activity, it will automatically kick off an on-demand translation cycle. So again, this wiki is designed to be a living, breathing heartbeat throughout the life cycle of the product. So as collaborative authoring continually takes place post-GA, we will decide that we want to kick off a translation run every week, every month, or again, based on the amount of activity that's taken place or the kind of activity. So that will be a, a future endeavor. Now. The wiki, by the way, is set up to, we, to read our customers' machine settings or web browser settings. So if somebody in Spain has their machine set to Spanish and they go to the wiki, it, the wiki will automatically look to see what their setting is and see if there's a Spanish wiki. And if there is, it will default to Spanish automatically. If not, it will always to stay with English, and that's critical because customers now get content in the language of their choice automatically. They don't have to select. So let me give you some examples of what the wiki looks like. On the left-hand side is the overall landing page. Now, it's important to know that customers can get to the wiki one of two ways. They can go to wiki.ca.com directly and do a product, product drop-down, which is what you see on the left. So if you go to the ca.com site, you would find this, this landing page. But the other thing we've done is we have started to link the topics in a given product wiki directly to the product UI. So when a customer is in a product, and they're on a specific screen, and they hit the Help button, it will open up their wiki contextually for the topic that matches that screen. So now what we've got are customers literally getting, getting a contextual search by default just by being in the right screen and the right topic opening up. So they'll get two things. They'll get a contextual topic. Again, right, if... If I was um, on a screen, one of the examples we use, we have a product called Clarity, which is a project management tool, and you're trying to set up financials, and you're struggling, and you click the Help button, the wiki for Clarity will open up to how to set up the financials right directly. Now, it will also, again, open up to the language of your choice. So if you've set that product to Portuguese or Korean, it will look to see if there's a wiki in that language. So customers will sometimes access the content from the product UI, 
Other times they'll go to the you know the wiki.ca.com page, select the product, and what they'll get is the picture on the right, which is the home screen of a specific product. In this case, I'm showing you cloud service management, which is basically a service desk product. So I'll take you through some of the uh, the uh, attributes. You can see here there are buttons in the upper right hand corner. Customers can create a PDF or EPUB um, output. They can do it for a topic, a number of topics, or the entire wiki. And it literally runs in a matter of minutes. Um, some customers like to do that, especially you know, some of the older customers that are used to having hard copies. Um, or there's some customers that then take that documentation and rebrand it because they put it in a manual inside their company. But that option is there if they need it. By the way, let me just go back here for a second. One of the things you'll notice is on the left-hand side is that as you progress through the wiki pages, we've always mapped it to have the corporate look and feel. So the, the CA wiki is branded to look like any other CA web pages. So it doesn't look like you're any, anywhere different in the CA.com website. So the, the headers and footers on here are actually corporate headers and footers for marketing. It's a standard header and footer across any CA.com page. So we can set the colors, the headers and the footers, again, to match the current branding schema. Uh, some of the other key attributes, language drop down. If you see, there's two buttons there. Uh, one is versions and one is languages. And you can drop down either one of those. So for some reason, you just want to know what languages that wiki is in and you want to flip to one, maybe your machine isn't set to French, but you want the French version, you can actually go and manually make the flip. We like it because we can always tell what languages we've translated fairly quickly. Now, the way the navigation works on the wiki is there's a left-hand navigation, and then there's the dark blue boxes, and customers will use one or the other, depending on their preference and, you know, just just kind of you know getting used to it. The upper right hand corner, if I if I actually click clicked on one of the topics in the navigation on the left or one of those blue boxes, this kind of gives you a feel for if you were to delve into a topic. And you can see what it looks like. In this case, you know, it's something about mapping Tennessee structures across the products and the solution. Also on the bottom left, you can see customers have the ability to provide content feedback. Now they can provide feedback, and this is where the customer interaction starts to take place. They can provide feedback um, at an overall wiki level or at a specific topics. They can rate the topic, and they can provide comments. And that's critical. And the reason it's critical, because inside every product wiki, is a customer interaction dashboard. Now, once an information engineer signs into their wiki, what they can do is have access to that dashboard and they can see things like activity trends. You know, how many thousands or hundreds of folks are hitting your wiki weekly, monthly, quarterly? The trend going up or is the trend going down? We can see customer SAT ratings. We can actually see what topics were liked or disliked. In fact, you can run that report for you personally because there may be more than one information engineer on a product, especially the larger products. So I could go in and see what are the top liked products that I wrote and what are the products that are disliked the most. Now, if I see a product that's disliked or, and this is what's really happening by the way, or I get a comment, I can literally go into the topic, make an adjustment, and republish the correction. And we are doing that as fast as 15 minutes. So comments coming in from customers, and it may be they can't find something, it may be they think we wrote something incorrect, like a command, whatever. If there's a fix that needs to be made, we can literally go in in minutes and republish. That's how fast it, it, it really happens. Now, while we built the dashboard to start to connect the information engineers to the customer, 
there was a side benefit that I don't think we really saw uh, when we when we embarked on this journey, and we realized with the Google Analytics that we had installed, we now knew where customers were trying to come from. We knew which language wikis they were using. We knew what cities, what countries, what geos, which is kind of cool if you're a product manager because what we do now is we go to them and we can say, hey, do you really want to do this product in Swedish? You've got 1% of your customers coming from Sweden. Is it really worth spending $200,000 to do the translation or whatever it costs? So for the first time now, product managers can start to make decisions based on true data analytics. The other thing they really like is we can tell you what browsers and what operating systems their customers are using. Some of these products are SaaS. And the likelihood is very strong. There's a strong correlation that if you're using Chrome to access the wiki, you're probably using Chrome to access the product. So if you find out that 85% of your customers are using Chrome, when you're testing your product, you're probably going to make sure that you know Chrome is really you know top notch, right? From a testing perspective, you're going to make sure that it's well tested and that you're enhancing that capability. Now, as we map topics in the wiki to the product UIs, one of the things we're working on is we're going to be able to go to a product manager and go, you know, you've got a hundred screens in your product, a hundred UI screens in your product, these five are driving 60% of the hits to the wiki. That means that either the, the function or the doc, something is not intuitive. So the functionality in the screen is not intuitive enough for the customer to be able to take action without going to the documentation. Because we have a belief that our goal actually as information engineers is to write zero documentation. In a perfect world, if the product is really intuitive, you don't need documentation. So our goal is always to write less words, not more words. Right? And we're going to do that by taking those analytics and enhancing the product. So the product can just be operated by the users independent of documentation. Now, we all know that we're never going to get to zero words, but the goal is to reduce the number of words. It'll make search easier, better, and it will reduce the translation cost. So let's just talk a little bit more about the DocOps platform. So we've designed a platform, first of all, in, you know, what's, what's really beneficial behind a platform is the fact that you can expand the platform through plug and play components, third party components, to really expand the ecosystem and, and the benefits of that platform. So any platform should have some core common functionality. Our core common functionality is around content management and translation. It also includes security and infrastructure monitoring, which I don't have on this chart. But that's the core. It'll never change. We may enhance it over time. But we can now mash in or aggregate additional content. So I'll give you some examples. We can bring in customer forums right, or customer discussion threads from user groups. So Jive is our community or user group application at CA. You may use Lithium. There's a host of different products out there. So now if you're a customer and you hit the help button in the UI, we all know that the topic from the wiki will open up, right? It'll be a contextual topic. It'll be in the language of your choice. But at the bottom of that, right underneath that topic on that same screen will be a window that basically is community discussions taking place out on the user groups around that topic. And if you're a customer and you enter in a question in the wiki, in that location, that question will be posed out on Jive to the larger community. So what we're doing is we're integrating Jive with a specific wiki topic right from inside the product. Google Analytics we've already talked about. Google Analytics will give us the stats 
for the dashboard. It's one of the ways to get some of the stats. Uh, we will find other ways uh, to generate other critical information as we make, you know, we really want to operate on more and more data analytics. Business intelligence is a major focus, right, of this journey. I believe we need to stop, you know, making decisions based on gut and start really making it on facts. Uh, Salesforce.com is a system we use, we're about to use for support case management. So we believe we can say, hey, here's some the latest solutions that closed on this topic. So not only do you get the topic, you get some community discussion, but you also get some recent support activity. And then last but not least, this platform is attracting a great deal of potential customers. It's easy to read. Uh, we're, we're very focused on search engine optimization out on Google. We're getting smarter and smarter about how to change the ranking in Google so that it shows up on the first page. Because if your content doesn't show up in the first 10 hits, then it'll never be seen by your customers. And probably, you know, 10 to 15 percent roughly of the customers are now coming from Google. It's kind of a third avenue. I talked about product UI access, direct access to the CA.com site, and Google search is actually a third avenue that's driving customers to the wiki. And customers today are doing a lot of self-research before they even talk to sales. So those customers are going to land on the wiki. There's 14 million words out there today. And they're going to land on the wiki on one of our products that they're looking for, and they're going to start investigating. So LinkedIn and Marketo, without getting into too much detail, will track that there's potential customers in, in the wiki. And it will profile those customers and actually push marketing material to them. Uh, that LinkedIn and Marketo is currently in test and going live uh, right after the first of the year. So we know it works, working very closely with those two companies. And marketing is excited because what every company has is an Apple or a CA.com, right, which is owned by marketing, and it's primarily there to attract and generate leads. And the industry has typically ignored the technical content. So we've expanded the pool by which we can now fish in for, for new customers. That's really what you're doing, right? You're throwing a a fish hook out there and you're hoping you can attract some customers to come in and look at your products. So the broader or wider that pond is, right, that you can fish in, the more likelihood you can generate more leads. So the end result is we've reduced the word count. Uh, we oscillate between 22 and 27 percent. We've moved 14 million words from the old documentation system to the wiki so far. We threw away over 3 million. So we only put about 11 million in the wiki. I always say it's like cleaning out your garage. Right? We had a garage that was just stuffed from side to side, top to bottom, right, front to back. And we didn't really know what we had in there until we pulled it all out in the driveway and started to really throw half the stuff in the dumpster. So we've thrown away 25% of the words, and we believe we can throw away another 20%. And we are working very hard to generate crisp, clean, relevant data, and that's what we want. And by the way, we've decreased non-value add activity by 10 to 25 percent, depending on the product. So this is the platform that we've built. It's accessible to the customers, again, via the product, contextually and from a language perspective. It's extremely agile. Customer comments are coming in every day, and and uh, information engineers are reacting within minutes, if not, you know, sometimes hours, but typically within minutes. We are continually upgrading and we're working with support to shut down knowledge docs. And I think that's an exciting piece because that's something different and that's something the industry needs to get off of. Knowledge docs are kind of an old way of doing it. It's like waterfall was to development. So when a support engineer recognizes there's a doc bug, they're able to go into the wiki and work with us 
and really update the original topic. Customers don't have to search through, you know, hundreds of different articles. They go to the topic, and if they go to the topic a month from now, the topic will be more mature, more robust. Right? Like a fine wine, it gets better with time. So we've got high degrees of collaboration from an authoring standpoint. Our information engineers are learning to curate or edit because the information engineers need to make sure that bad stuff isn't getting authored in the, in the wiki and need to make sure that the content stays relevant and crisp. And they've been taught how to curate or edit that content. So agility is there, collaboration is there, continuous update is there, and you can see content aggregation is occurring with things like Jive. So that's kind of our story right now. Let me turn it over. I think Larry, you're on. I am. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> um, so here, of course, is the uh, the CA wiki, and if you hit uh, return there, you can see that uh, when when CA came to us, uh, the problem as they described it was we we have over 24,000 documents and growing across 300 different products in as many as 19 languages, depending on the product. And we've got 300, you know, tech writers and translators that are involved in this process. And what we need is for this to be faster, more agile. It has to be repeatable because we're constantly releasing new versions of our software. Therefore, we're constantly publishing new documentation around that software. And it needs to be as automated as possible. Um, so if we go to the next slide, this was the business case um, that CA <clears throat> brought to us. And uh, you know the many challenges around being able to do all of that in an automated and repeatable fashion. Now we're happy to report, as Jim has shared, that uh, we were able to to work uh, with CA to bring uh, bring to market a solution that has resulted in a 55% faster turnaround on translation pro uh, translation processing. And ultimately, because that translated content is being published back into the platform which CA selected, uh, that being Atlassian Confluence, um, that means the content is being indexed by Google, the same as, as the English uh, documentation, which means it's SEO friendly for each language. So users can search Google in their own language and, and find uh, hits if, if, uh, um, for the documentation they're interested in. And of course, they can always come directly into the CA wiki and find content that way as well. So how does all of this work? If we go to the next slide, we can take a look at that. So the way that Lingotech enabled um, this, this agility in the translation process for product documentation is first by integrating deeply into uh, the Confluence platform. So as Jim mentioned, we have a plugin called Enterprise Translation Hub, which was uh, developed by our, our friends over at AppFusions. And that um, handles the seamless interaction between Confluence and Lingotech's cloud-based translation management system. As a cloud-based provider of translation technology and tools, Lingotech was well positioned to be able to provide the sort of agility and repeatability that CA was looking for. Once content has been pushed into the Lingotech cloud, um, we have lots of linguistic assets there which are used to help speed up the translation process and to ensure quality of translation. Um, Lingotech manages translation memories, which is a database of things that have already been translated before. Obviously, as you move from one version of documentation for a given product to another version of, of, of documentation for that same product, you're going to have a lot of words and sentences that remain the same. There'll, there'll be some changes and some additions based on new functionality, but for the most part, you're dealing with the same document. You don't want to have to pay to translate all of those words every time you release a new version of your product. That would be expensive and it would slow down the process. Translation memory ensures that you're only translating new or modified content when you release new documentation. Glossaries help ensure that there's a consistency of voice and style across your different languages. There are certain ways that CA wants to say certain things in certain languages. There's also certain words which shouldn't be translated, certain brand terms that should stay in English um, even after translation. Glossaries ensure that, and they ensure that quality during the translation process. And then lastly, Lingotech helps to automate the translation workflow. As Jim mentioned, CA works with a number of different translation vendors using a number of different um, translation workflows based on the product and the language. All of that is configured as part of a translation workflow, which automates this process. So 
going back into Confluence, when a tech writer creates new content and they publish it and they request translation to happen, it's a single button push. They click a button that says request translation and Lingotech knows what to do. It knows which languages to translate it into. It knows which vendors to route those translation jobs to. And when the translations are done, it even automates the publishing of those translations back into Confluence. So what you end up with is a uh, <clears throat> completely automated cycle for being able to request translation, have the translation be performed by the pre-selected vendors, and have those translations published back into the Confluence Wiki at CA. Uh, we're really grateful to have this opportunity today to work with CA, and, and uh, we'll, we'll stay on for any questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, PJ. Um, so I'm Tobias. I'm one of the founders of K15T Software, and our company is both Atlassian Enterprise Expert as well as Atlassian Platinum Expert. We are also vendors of uh, different add-ons, namely the scroll add-ons. So we are focusing on scroll content management add-ons for Confluence. Doing so, we try to support authors in all phases of the content lifecycle. So how to plan their content while authoring, tracking the quality or the workflow of their content, um, the publication as well as engaging customers. And as you can see, we have a lot of different plugins uh, for exporting content, version and variant management, translation management, and also authoring support um, using an integration with Acrolinks. So that's already a quick overview of what we are doing. Just visit our website for more details. And now I would like to hand over to PJ. Yes, thank you, Tobias. Um, and you, you know, I, I want to point out the K15T software plays a critical role in in supporting the uh, the success of the application at CA um, because they add a lot of document technical documentation capabilities on top of the uh, the wiki. So briefly about Acrolinks, our software allows you to manage your standards for your language, that is for your content, and then guide authors to follow those standards. That's really important in, an app, in a situation where you want to be very fast, very agile, the way, uh, the way is, you know, which is CA's requirement, as well as uh, create content that's more translatable. And again, because CA wants to do it quickly and, uh, and efficiently, um, the more translatable you can make your content before you send it to your translators, the better the quality and, uh, of course, the lower the cost. So with that, go to the last slide, please. Um, uh, thanks very much for a great presentation. We've got about uh, nine minutes left for a whole bunch of questions that we'll get to. But if we don't get to your question, there's our email address. It's right here on the slide. Please feel free to send us uh, to send us your questions directly. So Jim, I'm going to get right to it. I hardly know where to uh, to begin with all of these. But um, let's start with: Can you reuse content across your products? In particular. If you if you update if you make an update to your content in one in one version will that content just migrate forward as you create a new version of of your content? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, in some cases we have a common component, so that wiki is linked to multiple wikis. So reuse is um, is absolutely there. That was a key component for us. Great. And can you pull out hunks of content? and send them to the customer, say from within a mobile app? I mean, I know uh, we, don't do that to, yeah, we don't do that today. I think it could be done, but um, we, have not, we have not really had that requirement. Um, we, you know, the wiki is accessible via uh, a phone, although we're going to come out with a standalone phone app, which will make it much easier to use. Gotcha. Okay, good. Now, there's a few questions around translation. Um, a really good question here is, is translation keeping up with Agile content development? Are you, as you develop content, are you translating or do you wait for some defining moment such as, okay, the software is about to be available and then hit the button? So we translate after every sprint. Uh, we typically have, you know, four sprints in a, in a product release. What's interesting is in the old days, uh, so the development would go almost to the 11th hour, and what we would end up doing is is going GA with English, and then over the next couple of weeks, coming out with the various translated versions of documentation. Uh, with the uh, DocOps platform, at the time of GA, 
uh, we can do up to 19 languages in a simultaneous fashion. And and oh, so your GA when you go GA, you go GA with 19 languages simultaneously. Up to 19. We we actually translate. In fact, we just added a 20th language. So a product manager can elect to do anything from zero to 20 languages. We don't care how many. With Lingo Tech and the platform we've built, um, we can do them all in ser all in parallel. Gotcha. Um, you know what? We will go over a little bit for those who want to have their questions answered. I normally wouldn't do that, but I think there's so many great questions here that I think we ought to keep this going a little while longer. But for those of you who can't stay, then at least you could come back later and listen to the recording and hear the rest of the questions. So, do you localize 100% of the content that in, in all 20 languages? No. Um, every product is done differently because uh, depending on the sales plan for that region. So not every product that we produce um, is a viable product in every country. Right. Got it. And, you know, a good question, th we've got uh, several questions related to the topic, the higher level topic of managing the cost of all of this translation. If you have changes, say, in the content that occur during, you know, as a result of, of changing each sprint or of each sprint, you know, at the end of each sprint, and you make changes to the product, you make changes to the documentation, then you're paying to translate again, even though you hadn't even released it yet. So, how do you how do you manage that cost? Yeah, it's actually um, not really as incremental as people think, because what happens is, is when you go the first, every time you do you do a cycle, an iteration after a sprint, uh, you build up your translation memory. So the way you know translation works and the way LingoTech works is it knows what you've already translated and sort of puts it to the side. So what it's really looking for is what's delta new. Right, right. So you're willing to pay some perhaps minor penalty in additional localization costs in order to keep it agile, keep it quick. Yeah, no. But on the on the other spectrum right we are continuing to automate uh, we can we can select specific vendors by based on cost and quality um, and we're actually driving overall translation costs down the translation costs over the next couple of years including like two years behind us uh, we will have dropped translation costs by 33 percent Impressive. Um, so, well, there's there's still so many more, and they're still coming in. So, um, how do you? So you're saying that you so you're not reach, you're not reach you don't have to retranslate everything because because of course you're using translation memory. Are you also using or do you translators use machine translation as a way of uh, reducing cost? Yeah, so the way the, it's a three-step process. Step one is the document goes through translation memory, and it says, "Okay, uh, this 50% I've seen before, it puts it to the side. It takes the rest of the segments and puts those through machine translation. Whatever is left, then it puts it back together and essentially sends it to a vendor for human post-edit. So usually one vendor does both translation memory and machine translation management." Uh, for instance, we use Microsoft Hub a lot, and then we can pick another vendor to do post-edit. And the LingoTech platform tells the linguist where a segment was a match in translation memory, so the linguist can kind of ignore that. Hey, I've seen it before. I know it's already been corrected once. It's good. And they'll focus more on what went through the machine. Because that's where the errors are prone to happen. Right. Gotcha. Okay. And by the way, do you have human editors for your English content, or is Acrolinx, in fact, the only thing you're relying on before you send it out for translation? Uh, we only use Acrolinx and then any customer feedback. Because now we've got that customer inter interaction cycle. So if there is a, you know, a blatant problem, they'll catch it and we'll fix it real time, literally in minutes. Okay, there's a few questions about how you reuse or how you, you know, take advantage of single sourcing with uh, topic-based content, which, of course, wikis support. Um, how are you able to take that same content 
and build it into your HTML help or whatever help system you use built into your software? So the way it works is, our goal, by the way, is to not embed help in the products. That was a key, that was a key requirement of moving to the Doc Ops platform. So the only help, when you hit the help button in the product, the only thing that will do is fire up the wiki. Right, that's key. Because what we wanted was, you know, the problem with embedded help, quite frankly, is two things. Number one, it's extra work to go write that separate HTML. Because typically the embedded help in a product is not 100% match to the documents you're putting out on the web. It's kind of a shortened version, what maybe a Zoom search index built into it. So we said we want to stop doing that. The second problem is, quite frankly, it's dead on arrival. It's static content. And we want customers, again, to have access to the living, breathing wiki document. So as we move to new products or new releases, we're going to link help directly to this dynamic wiki. Now, with that said, we recognize there will be customers, especially in, due to HIPAA regulations or federal governments, that can't access via the Internet. Right? They've got some firewall restrictions. They have the ability to load the entire wiki into their product with in an HTML, you know, zoom index kind of format. So we built that capability into the wiki. Very good. And when it comes to reuse, are you able to reuse the same topic for, say, different software products, if if that should be necessary, so that you can yes. write, you can write make changes? Okay. Yes. In fact, we actually have a wiki that customers can't see, and what it is, it's a common component, and all the other products link to it. So the only way customers see it is through product A, B, and C. They don't know that there's a wiki called Z behind the scenes. So you can get real creative in, in how to structure your content to meet your needs or your specific requirements in your, in your products. And that mechanism that you're using for reuse, is that, someone asked, is that the, the multi-excerpt plugin or using something else? For that. I believe it's something else, and I, I may not know that specific answer. I apologize. No problem. If, if that's something that Tobias, your software does, speak up. Otherwise. I'm not sure, so we, we are caring about uh, reuse and reusing different portions out of different versions. So we resolve all of those dependencies automatically okay. to always include the right content. Got it. So that comes from K15T. Yeah. Good, thanks. Okay, a few more minutes, folks. Uh, we are going over, but I think it's I think it's this is really interesting stuff. So, does your uh, Doc Ops translation cycle also include translating the product content itself? So, for example, built in you know U, UI strings and that sort of thing. Yep. So the team that does um, that manages Lingo Tech translation is also responsible for uh, product UI. So the, so the resource files as well as marketing material. So they do all three. Oh, okay, got it. And are you able, do you, do you, well, first off, do you have screenshots in your product documentation? We do, but we try not to go crazy because it does make, and this is, a, this is kind of an ongoing uh, challenge for us, right? There's pros and cons to it. So, for instance, one of the plugins we chose was a product called Gliffy, which creates Visio-like diagrams. So we got rid of Visio and we moved to Gliffy. And the reason we did that is because we can externalize the Gliffy contents and translate them. Right. So now we're coming out with video editing software that will allow us to translate easier and faster. Uh, screenshots are still a challenge. Uh, what we typically do is not translate screenshots except in Japanese. So right now we're trying to limit the amount of, so we can have an entire document in Spanish with an English screenshot. Uh, and usually customers are okay with that. Yes, I can imagine that, that there could be a lot of ongoing debate about just how acceptable that is and different organizations yeah. will have different answers for that. Yeah. Interesting problem. So does CA require any sort of registration for customers to be able to get at the wiki documentation? Okay, so um, each wiki, uh, the content is either all public or 
partly confidential or all confidential is actually, I don't think there's anything left that's partly or all confidential. Let me take that back. Um, we work with each product manager to determine what portion of a wiki product needs to be locked down. Uh, as a corporation, 90% of our content is now open to the public. When we started this effort two years ago, by the way, only 20% was open to the public. And one of the things we encouraged the general managers to do was to open up their content uh, for greater accessibility, especially on Google. So we're at 90% today. So as a customer, when you go into the wiki and you hit a confidential spot, you'll know it, and it will prompt you to log in. Got it. But we can go and enjoy it ourselves just by going to, what's the URL again? You go to wiki.ca.com, drop down a product, and, and have at it. Right. And I've been there, and uh, yes, I've seen lots and lots of documentation, and I haven't run in anything where it says you better log in to see this. Yeah, you got to hit that 10%, right? But the point is you can lock it down. You can lock down whatever you need to lock down, including all Yeah, of we have single sign-on access using a product called SiteMinder. So the answer is yes. Uh, okay, great. Um, a quick question, I think. Does Lingotech send queries back to your author when the translator has questions? Um, yes. So it's – the answer is yes. Okay. So, so there's a process set up that allows linguists to actually go – by the way, most of the questions actually occur on the product UI, not the documentation. But the answer is yes. Okay, terrific. You know what? We're at five minutes past the hour. This has been um, really enlightening. Um, I hope the audience got as much out of it as I did. Um, I think what you've done is 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 really clever. I wish I had time to go through all the points that I think are are innovative and um, and uh, and interesting, but I'll have to leave that for another time. So thank you very much, Jim, for a great presentation, and also Larry and Tobias. Thank you for uh, helping to sponsor this and for your part in the presentation. Thanks, everybody else for coming and we'll, as I said at the start of this we'll have slides and recording available soon we'll send out notification via email